Between towering basalt cliffs and rugged talus slopes, the Columbia River cleaves a picture-perfect passage through the Saddle Mountain Gap dividing Grant and Kittitas counties in eastern Washington. At this location, just east of the once remote town of Vantage, the Columbia River is over 2,000 feet wide. This crossroads on one of the greatest rivers in the country has been a strategic state crossing for over a century. From the earliest pioneers to sheep herders, to casual motorists, and to the huge semi-trucks that today transport tons of produce from the rich farmland of the Columbia Basin. The river crossing at Vantage, Washington has been an important thoroughfare. Crossing the Columbia River at Vantage in 1915 took a lot more effort than it does today. Travelers in Model T's drove a mile over sand and river cobbles to get to the ferry landing on either side of the river. Although a road existed on both sides of the river, the only way to cross was by way of a gasoline-powered scow that carried two cars at a time. By 1917, automobile traffic had increased to the point that Kittitas and Grant County governments purchased the new four-car Kitty Grant Ferry. Grant and Kittitas counties paid Frank Potter $100 a month to run the Kitty Grant Ferry, and they gave him a house to rent out to travelers. 1923 records from the Kitty Grant Ferry documented transporting 50,000 people across the Columbia River at Vantage that year. In 1924, the state of Washington made plans for a new bridge at Vantage to accommodate the new cross-state Highway 10. The first bridge at Vantage was built by the Portland firm of Kuchenberg and Whitman at the cost of $628,000. It was the first steel cantilever bridge built in the state. The bridge was 2,475 feet long. It was dedicated on September 8, 1927. Jim Boer remembers what it was like traveling on the old bridge. The old Vantage Bridge was, was very narrow. It was built more like Model T Ford days than it was <laughs> for heavy traffic. When you crossed the Vantage Bridge, you had to be careful that you didn't knock the mirrors off if you met another truck. <laughs> In 1935, Tom Stockdale and his wife Catherine moved to Vantage. We, we had our honeymoon in Oregon and came up here to a place I had never seen. And it was a, a, just a little log cabin at the end of the old bridge, at the, of the Vantage Bridge. There was no running water, there was no electricity, and we arrived in a um, Model A Ford to Vantage. And when we got here, it was 115 on July 15th, in the middle of the summer. And hotter I had never been in my life. So I thought I had jumped into something a little warmer than I liked. The Texaco service station was the first one to come and, and uh, wanted to put their gas in. Then came Rainbow, then came uh, Chevron, and uh, Shell, 76. We had every known make of gasoline at that time. I think there were five or six pumps, each with its own gasoline in it. And all of these pumps, of course, were hand pumped. We, there was no electricity, so there were visible pumps. You pumped the gas up to, and, and just floated out gravity. People would come in, and I'd go out and Maybe, maybe my husband was out busy with his oil or doing something, and, and I would uh, go out and pump gas. They said, can't we find something to eat here? I said, well, I don't know. I was just about ready to cook up some hamburgers. Would you like one? Oh, yes. So I'd fix them a hamburger. And gradually as time went on, I happened to be baking a pie. Someone said, I smell that pie. Can I have a piece? So that's the way our restaurant started. 
just because people came in, were hungry, wanted to eat something. And so we, pretty soon we, were, we had a little lunch counter built in, and that grew from a lunch counter to a, to a restaurant. Christine Brown's family operated a large sheep ranch at Vantage. So we moved there in 44. The, there, was, there was no electricity in Vantage then. There were about, we had about 3,000 head of views, that's the mothers, and then they'd, maybe half of them would have two lambs and the others would just have one, so there would be about four or 5,000. But they, they were divided into bands of about 1,000 mothers apiece. And then I remember most when they came back in the fall and came across, you know, and coming towards us. And they were just, oh, they were so happy to be coming home. They were just really going along fast. They knew where they were going. Every once in a while, a truck would kind of lose its brakes coming down into Vantage. <laughs> and luckily, it was a straight shoot across the bridge, you know, and, and they could slow down some, but they had more than one have the brakes go out on the way down. While the bridge provided cross-state traffic direct passage, the roads in Grant County were virtually non-existent. Bob Ping and his wife Nida moved to the Columbia Basin in 1946. It was all dirt just out through the prairie. You just drove where you wanted to go through the prairie. The, the road system wasn't put in until, uh, until later. Uh, it got started, I think, in about 40... Must have been about 47 when that really got started, when they really started putting in some roads. And they, of course, to start with were all gravel, and then they've been paved since then. But the network that's out there now was not, was not here in 1945. It was, it was difficult to get from one location to the next. And then when those roads got opened up, then people started moving out here pretty fast. There was just farm after farm came just you just, you'd drive by one week and there'd be nothing there. Next week there was a building a house. It was pretty fast there for a few years. Fred Yates grew up in Quincy, 12 miles northeast of the bridge. This boy that I grew up with, his folks had a, um, on this side of the bridge, which would be the Grant County side of the bridge, they had a, uh, a, a small gas station and a cafe uh, right along the highway there. Then and out and back, they had a, a quite a large trailer court, and of course, a lot of the employees of the power company, or uh, con contractors, I should say, they lived uh, in that trailer court, and a lot, I got to know a lot of fellows through that, but uh, my buddy had a Corvette, and so we spent a lot of time running back and forth across that bridge, and uh, in and out of there, because uh, you, it was only 20 miles from Quincy, and so that was a, a real close area to travel back and forth through. You know, there was a lot of gas stations in, in Vantage. When I say a lot, it's a different type of a filling station than we know it today as a convenience store and fuel. It was more of a family uh, thing. People got to know each other more because it was more of a hands-on experience where uh, it, today uh, you uh, go in with your uh, plastic card, get fuel, and, and move on, where back in the old days it was all done with cash, and, and so there was a lot more personal uh, uh, it was a lot more personal. You had a more hands-on experience a visit with the people around the, the Vantage area there. So it was a family thing. I mean, everybody looked forward to coming through Vantage. It was a, it was a place to stop and fuel and, and get a cold drink. And they didn't, uh, you know, get some ice and, uh, and that sort of thing. It was, a, it was, a, it was a, a real interesting stopping place. So a hot hamburger was a, was a big thing back in those days to get advantage. It was well known uh, to have... Uh, what we call uh, greasy uh, uh, spoon type places, you know, uh, uh, where, what people look for. It kind of stick to your bones, you know. It lasts with you all day, or like oatmeal, you know. Doreen Bendixson remembers the old winding Highway 10 through Whiskey Dick Canyon. Then down, I mean, remember going down to go to Ellensburg, down the old Vantage, um, across the old Vantage Bridge, down that. Uh, drive down the hill with the beautiful rock formations that are there, just very striking. 
rock formations that are there going down across the bridge and up the other side and stopping and taking the kids to see the Ginkgo um, Interpretive Center there and uh, stopping at the rock shop that was there to see the petrified rocks. Um, my kids were into, I have boys, and they're into rocks. So they thought it was really neat. And then taking the old Vantage Hill up into Ellensburg and seeing the wonderful views of Mount Rainier that you can see from, from that drive going into Ellensburg and just going for a drive. When the water was coming, going to be coming up, I decided that was a historical event that is something that the girls I worked with in the church group could go and, vi and see as part of, part of the program that we did. And so we did a field trip taking the girls over to see that. So I chose to take the girls across the new bridge over to the other side down the old highway below the interpretive center because the hill was steeper with the idea that you could see the water coming up easier on the steeper hill than you could on the real gradual hill. So we parked the car way back up and walked down the road. And because of what they had talked about of the water coming up going to put the rattlesnakes out of their holes, it was like you stay on the pavement, no going off the pavement. Because if there are snakes coming, you can see them coming on the pavement. So you have to stay on the pavement. We were down and we would put rocks down and then time how many seconds it took for the water to come up, how many inches to where the rocks were on the road and there wasn't anything scientific about it. It was just fun for them to kind of figure out who was right. Well, is it going to take 10 seconds for it to come up or is it going to take 20 seconds for it to come up to that next rock? But it was astounding how fast the water came in and came up. In 1956, when the Grant County PUD began construction of their first dam at Priest Rapids, the little town of Vantage, with 30 residents, became more than just a convenient stopping place. On July 16, 1959, the Grant County PUD and the Washington State Highway Commission entered into an agreement that would make it possible for the state to build a new four-lane highway and bridge across the river advantage. The PUD would pay four and a half million dollars towards the effort, which placed the new bridge a mile and a half downriver from its original location. The new bridge is 2,500 feet long and 52 feet wide. The center span of the bridge is 520 feet and rises to a height of 250 feet over low water. Pete White helped build the new bridge advantage. So uh, I left Priest Rapids and I went up to the bridge advantage and worked up there for about eight months. I enjoyed that as crane operator up there, and I raised all that iron on the west end up Vantage Bridge. The piers were all erected by another contractor. So when I went to work for American Bridge, all we had to do was actually erect the bridge itself, put the steel in place. Uh, the big girders, in fact, all the steel came in on the Milwaukee Railroad and was unloaded down at Shawana, Beverly. And for the big girders, they had two flatbed trucks, low beds, backed up to each other. They put this beam on both trucks. One would drive forward, and the other would have to back up all the way from, from Beverly up across the old bridge, back around to the new bridge site, where I would take the beam off the uh, rigs, and then we'd put it up in the air. This process is very precise because your beams don't have that much room in them, have very, very little room for error. So you hope that this beam fits, you hope that that beam fits, you hope that this beam in the middle fits. When they bring it up there, a rigger will stick a spike wrench, spud wrench into the hole, and they'll start bolting this beam together. It might take them two hours or more to bolt the beam into place. When they have it bolted into place, then they will ease off on the crane a little bit. Come down easy and let's see how everything's going to look. And if the beam stands up there, you're fine. You're in good shape. 
Uh, then the Rivet Gang would move in. That was quite a sight to see the Rivet Gang. They set up a platform up on top of the span, and a fellow was up there with his forge, and he'd heat the rivets. He had a hand forge up there, he'd heat the rivets. And a fellow down there was ready for rivets. He had a tin cup about that big around, about that deep, just like, like a funnel. He'd say, holler up, okay, I'm ready. He'd hold that tin cup out, and the, and the fellow heating the rivets would take one with his tongs out of the fire, toss it to him. This guy would reach out and catch a tin can, pick up a pair of tongs, shove it to hold, and get a buck gun on one side, and the other guy bang, 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 bang. That's the way you rivet a bridge. Uh, they didn't miss too often. That guy was there with a tin can. That guy up top would really throw. I mean, he was, he was, I tried it a couple of times, and Lord, my rivets would wind up all over the place just for the heck of it. But uh, these fellows that uh, heated rivets were very accurate with that throwing. Uh, that's the only way you can get it to, because you got maybe two or three crews riveting at the same time. And so you got place here, place here, place here. Uh, the only days we couldn't work on there is when the wind was blowing. The wind would get blowing about 40 miles an hour. We, we couldn't work because the riggers couldn't hang on up there. And you're trying to jack in a 40-ton girder up there, 100 feet in the air, you've got to have good control on it. And if that wind gets to blowing too much and some guy's hanging off a of deer life up there, it's, it's, it's no good. So we just stop all operations until the wind died down. We did have some people freeze up on the iron out of pure terror. Um, I picked one of these girders up one day and was holding it in position. Generally, when you do this, you have to sit there for about two hours or better till they get it all bolted in. And this one fellow was up on the iron and he just laid down the iron, just grabbed onto the iron, you know, for dear life. And there's no, nothing you can do for him, he just has to wait. So after they finally got the girder bolted into place and they cut me loose, I dropped the block immediately and we picked up a skip. A couple guys climbed the skip and they went up there. And I laid him up alongside this fellow and they technically had to pry him off that iron. I mean, he had a death grip on that iron. No way in the world was he going to get loose of it. And they got him into the basket and sat on him. I put him down and he came out of the basket, walked over the shack and they gave him his check right there. He came back to work 10 days later. <laughs> I think the, the biggest thing I saw was when they jacked that bridge together because when they finished, put the last beam in, and they literally, they did, they jacked the bridge up like this until it fit, and then they bolted it together. And after they got it all bolted together, then the rivet gang moved in. They put permanent fixtures down here to hold it in place, and that's your bridge. That's the way it's done. I can tell you where the last piece of iron is that went up on that bridge, too. <laughs> so on the north side, uh, where the span starts up, it's one, two, three, the fourth girder, fourth vertical girder on the north side. So that's the story of the bridge. Then after we finished the concrete work, then of course the other contractor moved in to, to pave the bridge and uh, put handrails up and all those kind of good things. The bridge was dedicated by Governor Albert Rosalini on November 9, 1962. The old steel cantilever bridge was removed and rebuilt in 1968 at Lyons Ferry on the Snake River, where it remains today. Department of Transportation records show that an average of 10,000 vehicles cross the Vantage Bridge each day. Although the landscape has changed at the crossing, the river continues to flow beneath the never-ending rush of traffic that speeds through day and night, linking the east and west sides of the state. Of course, there wasn't the traffic and the speed wasn't so great and the cars weren't as strong or as uh, high-powered, you know, as they are now. Things all relative. 